Good morning, I'm Valerie Castro. And I'm Stephen Romo. Joe and Savannah are on assignment. Right now on Morning News Now, history in the making. Donald Trump becomes the first former U.S. president to face criminal charges. It's a landmark moment for American politics. A Manhattan grand jury indicted Trump yesterday as part of an investigation into alleged hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels. This happened during the 2016 election, allegedly this move sparking an emotional response from both supporters and opponents. I'm here because I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm celebrating the indictment of Donald J. Trump. He is being raked over the coals for something ridiculous. So we now live in a banana republic, apparently. We'll look at how this watershed moment sets up a potential showdown in court with Trump expected to surrender to authorities early next week. And that indictment could just be the tip of the iceberg for former President Trump, who's facing a series of other legal battles. How another investigation focusing on Trump's handling of classified documents could pose an even bigger headache. And with the legal costs piling up, the former president is now calling on his supporters to donate money for his defense. Also this morning, vindicated a legal victory for Gwyneth Paltrow in the trial following a ski crash that injured a retired Utah man. We've got the latest on what it means for the actor. Plus, gamers rejoice from Tetris to Dungeons and Dragons. We'll take a look at some of the classic games making the jump to the big screen this weekend in our latest edition of the Can't Miss List. A little bit of everything this morning, but of course we do want to begin with that stunning moment making history in the United States. A Manhattan grand jury has voted to indict former President Trump in connection with a case involving a $130,000 hush money payment he allegedly made to adult film star Stormy Daniels. The unprecedented move setting up what will be a closely watched legal battle through uncharted waters. For his part, the former president has denied any wrongdoing. We have every angle of this story covered, beginning with NBC News senior congressional correspondent Garrett Haig outside the New York District Attorney's office. Garrett. The grand jury handing up their historic indictment two months to the day after they were first impaneled. Now Donald Trump, former president of the United States, will have to come to the courthouse here in lower Manhattan and face a judge. Grand jurors in Manhattan setting off a stunning legal earthquake Thursday, voting to indict a former president for the first time in history. The political aftershocks rippling across the country this morning, even while the specific charge or charges against Donald Trump remain secret and under seal. The district attorney's office saying it has, quote, contacted Mr. Trump's attorney to coordinate his surrender. Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg's investigation centers on the $130,000 2016 payment allegedly made to buy the silence of adult film actress Stormy Daniels, who claims she had an affair with Mr. Trump a decade prior. Mr. Trump has denied the affair or any other wrongdoing. On social media Thursday night, blasting the investigation as a, quote, political persecution and election interference at the highest level in history and labeling DA Bragg a disgrace. The former president adding he, quote, cannot get a fair trial in New York. Republican lawmakers rallying to the former president's defense from longtime allies. This is going to destroy America. We're going to fight back at the ballot box. To even potential 2024 campaign rivals. The unprecedented indictment of a former president of the United States on a campaign finance issue is an outrage. Congressional Democrats have largely praised the indictment decision as upholding the rule of law, while the White House has thus far stayed silent. The criminal processing of a Secret Service protectee will be another historic first, as Mr. Trump will have his mugshot taken, fingerprints, and even a DNA swab collected, all while his detail of agents stand guard. The case at the center of the indictment took off when Mr. Trump's former fixer, Michael Cohen, pled guilty to campaign finance violations in connection with those hush money payments, which the Department of Justice called an attempt to influence the 2016 presidential election. Cohen said he was acting at the direction of the former president. But Mr. Trump has pushed back, saying he was the victim of extortion by Stormy Daniels. Federal prosecutors ultimately decided not to pursue charges. But all eyes are now on Bragg as he makes his case against former President Trump. 
Multiple sources familiar with the grand jury's work say prosecutors also questioned some witnesses about earlier hush money payments made to a former Playboy playmate named Karen McDougal, although it's not clear yet if those payments are related to any charge or charges filed against Mr. Trump. Now, as for the scene here in New York City, security on Tuesday is expected to be tight. The NYPD has already told all officers to report to duty today in uniform, ready to be deployed ahead of possible protests. Garrett Haig, thanks so much. Well, Trump's legal team is speaking out this morning. His attorney, Joe Takapina, appeared on the Today Show talking about this case and what's next. Take a listen. Have you been told anything about the nature of the charges in this indictment? No, I mean, specifically, no. Uh, we don't know how many counts. We don't know what the, 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 the actual charges are. Um, but we do know it centers around, uh, uh, you know, a legal, very common confidentiality agreement that was signed years and years ago um, with uh, Stormy Daniels and between her attorneys and, and, and Michael Cohen. Uh, those were the parties to the uh, confidentiality agreement. Um, so it's nothing more than that, which is really what makes this shocking. Uh, this is a historic case, a monumental case, a case that will have wide reaching um, ramifications. And it, it really, today, in, I, I feel very concerned about the rule of law in this country because it endangers the rule of law. Do you expect the president to voluntarily surrender? Will he come for his arraignment? We're working out those logistics right now, Savannah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, he's not going to uh, hole up in, in Mar-a-Lago. So we'll, he'll face this, and we'll face it, and uh, we'll be successful, I'm sure. Do you expect this to go to trial? Do you see any scenario in which you or the former president would take a plea deal? Zero. Zero. First of all, I'm not taking a plea deal to anything, but, but uh, you know, President Trump will not take a plea deal in this case. It's not going to happen. There's no crime. I don't know if it's going to make the trial because we have substantial legal challenges that we have to, to front before we get to that point. And we should note, Takapina went on to clarify that the payments made to Stormy Daniels were internal business records, and therefore, he says, they did not need to be filed with any government entities. Now let's get to NBC News correspondent Sam Brock outside of Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate in Palm Beach, Florida. Sam, good morning. What's the latest where you are? Do we have any insight into what may have gone on behind the scenes with Trump and his inner circle since news broke of this indictment? Yeah, Valerie, good morning, and it's very calm this morning right now. We did see some protesters last night. That is not the case as of yet here in West Palm Beach. And, you know, it's interesting to your question, that interview, the clips that you just played with Joseph Takapino, really provide the best insight we've received so far as to what was going on at Trump camp, and specifically that he was, quote, shocked when he found about this. So for all of the, the broadcasting that took place about possible indictments coming a week and a half from now, this took... Former President Trump and his legal team completely off guard, according to Takapina. And he also highlighted there, Valerie, the fact that they don't know exactly how many charges there are in this still sealed indictment, you know, what the nature of them might be. And it was interesting, his language as well, when he talked about a, quote, confidentiality agreement with Stormy Daniels. You did not hear the words hush money payments coming out. And as Stephen just said a second ago, he wanted to make it very clearly, per Savannah's question, that these were internal filings. That they were not filed formally for, say, tax purposes with the federal government or with the FEC as potential election uh, disclosures, that they were just internal. So we'll see how that actually plays out in court. But this is the first information we've really seen from anyone inside Trump world about what happened last night. And Sam, Trump is obviously a major presence in Palm Beach due to his Mar-a-Lago resort. How is the town reacting to all of this? Yeah, you look over my shoulder right now, Valerie, and it's 40, 50 million dollar estates on the water. It wouldn't necessarily be the Palm Beach residents that would go out and protest. Uh, we're seeing oftentimes people coming in from out of state or other parts of Florida and getting on a bridge that's pretty close to where I'm standing right now that connects West Palm with Palm Beach. And last night, this was kind of the scene there. You'll see about 15 to 20 protesters with their flags. I am told after I left last night well into the 10 o'clock hour that it got up to about three dozen until police closed it down. Uh, we did have some conversations with folks there as well who see this as part of a larger narrative, not just about potentially illegal payments that were made or what kind of federal crime that could be linked to. Here's what one woman told me. First they tried to the Russian hoax, then they tried to impeach him, you know, with the Ukraine thing. It's all that just keep going, keep going, keep trying to find him. But he's not going to get arrested. If he does, he's innocent. And he'll be back as our president in 2024. 
I will also say some of the folks definitely had a nuanced understanding of this case, and specifically the idea that it's been you know, five or six years now since the situation first came to light and there hadn't been action until now from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, and they're arguing there's a statute of limitations here that's been trans transgressed. I'll leave that to the attorneys, but there's definitely questions about why the federal government had looked at this, why uh, Alvin Bragg's predecessor, Cy Vance, had also looked at it and had not decided to bring charges, and here we are today. And Sam, we know Trump is expected to surrender and will be arraigned Tuesday. What do we know about the logistics of getting him from Florida to New York for that arraignment? All right. Well, so we just heard from Takapina, his attorney, a second ago, saying that that has not been fully worked out yet. But our understanding is that the former president would be leaving Mar-a-Lago at some point early next week, going to Palm Beach International Airport, which is about 10 or 15 minutes away from where I am right now, and ultimately ending up uh, in southern Manhattan and going and being processed like anyone else would be uh, under these circumstances, although certainly you wonder how much uh, visual component will be attached to it, if there could be a quote-unquote perp walk or not. Uh, we'll find out, but definitely fingerprinting and a booking photo more than likely will end up uh, out there in the public discourse at some point next week, guys. Okay, Sam, with the updates from Florida, thanks so much. All right, let's bring in NBC News legal analyst and former federal prosecutor Glenn Kirshner. Glenn, good morning. Thanks for being here. So, of course, this indictment is still under seal, and Trump's lawyer is telling NBC News he's expected to be arraigned on Tuesday. Is that when we can expect to see this indictment, or is it possible it could be revealed earlier? It's possible it could be revealed earlier, but it's most likely going to be uh, released publicly at the time Donald Trump walks into court for his arraignment. Now, an arraignment is uh, um, a first court appearance in a case. Um, I tell my students at George Washington University that is a the first eyeball to eyeball a defendant has with a judge. That is when a criminal case gets very real for everyone involved. The court will read the indictment, the charges to the defendant, unless Donald Trump's defense attorneys waive formal reading of the indictment. The defense attorneys will enter a not guilty plea. And then the, the most consequential discussion that I think we will see is what does the judge do with Donald Trump pending trial? Um, there may be um, discussions surrounding whether he should be prohibited from traveling outside the United States, for example. There may be discussions surrounding whether the judge should limit Donald Trump's speech or what he can post on the Internet pending trial. We have all seen him say and post incendiary things that seem reasonably likely to inspire imminent lawlessness. We saw that play out on January 6th. So I suspect there will be at least a discussion of whether a partial or narrowly tailored gag order should be put in place. You know, all of this is so uncharted that, you know, I think uh, we will be interested to see exactly how these discussions unfold. Yeah, a defendant like none other, of course, as we've said, and we'll continue to say this is unprecedented. And as a former federal prosecutor, what are the difficulties in trying a case under this type of intense spotlight? I know Congress is already asking, some members of Congress, asking Alvin Bragg to come testify before them already. You know, as a prosecutor who for 30 years had to make charging decisions, I tended to tune out all of the collateral consequences, all of the noise. So when you hear people say, well, this will only strengthen Donald Trump politically, or you hear people say this will damage Donald Trump politically, you know, prosecutors should, and in my experience generally do, sort of tune that all out, set it aside, and they, you know, present a case to the jury um, that is, you know, the, the marshalling the facts and the law as best they can. And that's what I suspect Alvin Bragg's team will do. Now, there may be a circus atmosphere going on outside the courtroom, but I think inside the courtroom, you're going to see the rule of law prevail. When you see Donald Trump's lawyer, Joe Tacopina, say all sorts of things, you know, all of that will melt away and the facts and the law will rule in the courtroom. And 12 citizens who are sitting in that jury box as the conscience of the community will decide whether Donald Trump is guilty or not guilty. All right, Glenn Kirshner, a lot of uncharted stuff going on here. Thanks for breaking that down for us.
Trump's indictment might have major implications for the upcoming 2024 presidential race. The unprecedented grand jury decision doesn't stop the former president from running for office, but it does raise questions about what's next for his campaign and his political rivals. NBC News senior Washington correspondent and News Now anchor Hallie Jackson has the details. Hey there, Stephen and Valerie. Good morning to you both. We are seeing former President Trump's Republican rivals rallying around him this morning, for the most part, echoing his attacks on this investigation with Mr. Trump himself defiant. A show of support this morning from potential competitors in the GOP presidential race lining up to back up Donald Trump's claim his indictment is politically motivated. This appears to be just one more example, Wolf, of the kind of two-tiered justice system. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, not officially in the race, but widely seen as Mr. Trump's closest competitor for the Republican nomination, accusing the Manhattan District Attorney of stretching the law to target a political opponent. Mr. Trump himself has said even if indicted, his campaign would continue. I wouldn't even think about leaving. His team already fundraising, selling these new T-shirts overnight featuring the date of the indictment. The former president has used the investigations against him to rally supporters. And people see it's bull and they go and they say, it's unfair. For now, Mr. Trump's getting backup from allies on Capitol Hill, too. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy saying the GOP-controlled House will hold Alvin Bragg and his unprecedented abuse of power to account. Many of the attacks against Bragg describing the DA as a Soros-backed prosecutor, a reference to George Soros, a liberal mega-donor and for years target of conservatives. Soros was among those who donated to a political action committee that supported Bragg's campaign, but a Soros spokesperson tells NBC News George Soros has never met spoken with or otherwise communicated with Alvin Bragg. Bragg has criticized the former president, something Mr. Trump's allies have also seized upon to cast him as a partisan prosecutor. Uh, and I've seen him up front and seen the lawlessness that he can do. And he's touted going after the former president legally, according to The New York Times, saying in 2021, it is a fact that I have sued Trump more than 100 times. The Manhattan DA investigation itself has been in the spotlight, with top prosecutors resigning last year, including Mark Pomerantz, who, frustrated at the pace of the inquiry when he resigned, wrote the probe had turned into a legal equivalent of a plane crash under Bragg and was due to pilot error, something Bragg pushed back on. As far as the political sphere, Mr. Trump's poll numbers really haven't moved much after other news events that could potentially have been damaging, like after the FBI search of his Mar-a-Lago home. And the most recent polling, including some out just this week, has shown his support has actually grown compared to last month. Back to you. All right, Hallie Jackson, thanks so much. All right, time now for a check of your Morning News Now weather. Meteorologist Angie Lastman joins us now. Good morning, Angie. Good morning, guys. That latest cross-country storm system is on the move and impacting the east through the next day or so. We already have heavy rain in place for parts of really the Midwest extending down into the south, and we've got snow to deal with, too. We're also going to set up for the potential to see some really strong storms later today. This could be a, a dangerous condition, a dangerous situation, rather, developing with the conditions that are set in place for this afternoon. We have the potential to see some strong, even long-track tornadoes in many locations. We'll talk more about that here in a moment but we're also going to watch for some intense wind gusts. We could see up to 70, 75 mile per hour winds at times. We know that's going to be problematic for uh, damage with, with um, power outages and such. Uh, and we also could see some golf ball size to even tennis ball size hail. Difficult situations for this afternoon. It includes a large area. More than 15 million people are included in this. And there's that risk for EF2 or higher tornadoes. This isn't just a daylight hours kind of thing. I really want to stress that point because we know that when tornadoes come into the overnight hours, they're much more deadly uh, and we could see that happening after the sun goes down in a lot of these places Des Moines St. Louis Memphis as far south as Greenville all included in this if you're in that kind of shaded area even into the green Detroit Chicago you're not out of the woods you'll still see some of these stronger storms likely developing in your area but uh, the best chance for tornadoes is where you saw that red we're also going to watch for the potential for some flooding concerns with heavy rain working through through tomorrow. We have really saturated grounds in a lot of these places that have had repeated storms uh, over the past few weeks or so. So the grounds are saturated. The streams are a little swollen. It won't take much to see some flooding concerns. So remember not to drive through those flooded roadways. In addition to that, the system also has a wintry aspect to it. The winter weather alerts are up to 11 million. We've got wind alerts up to low 60s as far as the millions are concerned. And Minneapolis and 
and through Rapid City are, are going to be dealing with uh, the the heavy snow working through. But also, in addition to that, with those those really strong winds, we could see some blowing snow, reducing visibility to even as, as low as zero. Um, travel is going to be tough in this area. You see going from South Dakota into parts of Minnesota and even as far east as the northern as the upper peninsula of Michigan. This is going to be something here that we deal with through at least today and tomorrow. Uh, we'll see those damaging winds lasting through today and tomorrow as well, guys. So power outages with heavy, wet snow, it's going to be a problem. Is it normal for winter to hang on? Up north, this yeah, you this know, this is technically a spring storm ah. on the move, and we're kind of setting up for that kind of, uh, you know, that part of the year. But yes, of course, we still have the cold temperatures, so northern yeah. side of the system, snow it is. So got to get used to being up north. All <laughs> exactly. right, exactly. Thanks so much, Angie. <laughs> Coming up, a legal victory for Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah, a jury cleared the star of wrongdoing in that 2016 crash that left a Utah man injured. How the Hollywood star got the verdict she wanted, and what it means for the man who was behind that failed lawsuit. That's next. We're back now with an NBC News broadcast exclusive. A former Fox News producer is speaking out about January 6th and the false election claims made by guests of the network who said the election was stolen from former President Trump. Abby Grossberg, who was fired last week by Fox, is now suing her former company. NBC News senior legal and investigative correspondent Cynthia McFadden has more on what Grossberg says she experienced at that network. When veteran TV producer Abby Grossberg took a job with Maria Bartiromo at Fox News four years ago, she thought she was advancing her career. We were known as a dynamic duo at Fox, and our ratings were skyrocketing. Now she's suing Fox, claiming she was harassed and retaliated against. On the first page of your lawsuit, you say, Fox News fosters a toxic workplace where truth remains a fugitive while female workers are verbally violated on almost a daily basis by a poisonous and entrenched patriarchy. Those are strong words. I stand by them. After being denied a promotion, she moved to Tucker Carlson's show. Women were objectified. It was a game. It was a sport. Female politicians who came on the show were mocked. There were debates about who they'd rather sleep with. C-word all the time. But that's not the only reason she's suing. She says Fox lawyers have tried to turn her and Bartiromo into sacrificial female lambs to protect high-ranking men at the network from Dominion Voting System's $1.6 billion lawsuit. Dominion alleges Fox knew or should have known it was airing false claims about Dominion rigging the 2020 election. There has been a massive and coordinated effort to steal this election. Those from claims were made on five Fox United shows States by President America, Trump's lawyers Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell, including Bartiromo's. Grossberg says she and Bartiromo believe they were just doing what the network wanted. What were you told about fact-checking? Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani. There will be no fact checking. I received a text message from my boss saying, you can let Maria know there will be no fact checking today. She can do what she wants. Go wild. There are producers who would say, I would walk out the door. I wouldn't put something on the air that I couldn't stand up factually. I wish that I had the power to do that. I wanted to keep my job. She says Fox's lawyers told her she didn't need her own attorney, but she began to wonder as they prepared her for her Dominion deposition. Did the Fox lawyers attempt to intimidate you, harass you, push you to say things that were not true? Oh, 100% they did, yeah. And I realized that the answers that they wanted me to say were putting me in a very vulnerable position to be the company's scapegoat. It's really, really terrifying to think that you could be the fall guy and perhaps the biggest media case our country's ever had. You were widely criticized. Yeah. How'd that feel? I mean, people said you were a lousy journalist because, among other things, you had said in reply to a question that you did not believe that it was your responsibility to fact check whether or not what someone was going to say on the broadcast was telling the truth. It felt awful. I was bullied, intimidated, and coerced into saying that just to keep my job and stay at the company. And the question a lot of people would have is, why would you do that? Why would you do that? Because I made the decision to keep my job. Grossberg says all of it has taken a toll on her health. I reached a breaking point where the harassment was so bad that I called a crisis line. 
I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Did you literally think of taking your life? I thought I could just walk in front of a car and I wouldn't have to go to work tomorrow. Saying that out loud <laughs> in an interview where people are going to see it, it's hard. Fox News says it hired outside counsel to investigate Grossberg's claims. And they say the assertion that Ms. Grossberg was coached or intimidated into being dishonest during her Dominion deposition is patently false, adding her legal claims are riddled with false allegations. They're a big corporate machine that destroys people. I sat in those meetings. I heard them laugh about tearing apart politicians. And now I know that in those meetings, they're talking about me. Cynthia McFadden, NBC News, New York. We've been following the high-profile Gwyneth Paltrow ski accident case, and now it's finally come to a close in Paltrow's favor. An eight-person Utah jury found the actress not liable in the case where a man accused her of seriously injuring him on the slopes. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer has more. The jury of eight said not only was Gwyneth Paltrow not at fault, but that the man suing her is to actually blame for the accident, a unanimous decision for the actress. Was Gwyneth Paltrow at fault? No. It took the jury roughly two and a half hours to reach their verdict. Gwyneth Paltrow was not at fault and caused no harm to Terry Sanderson during their 2016 collision on a Park City ski slope. The actress turned defendant, stopping to wish Sanderson well after the verdict. Her exact words, I wish you well. Very kind of her. Paltrow was awarded $1 as the eight-day courtroom saga came to a dramatic end. Very happy. Stephen Owens is Paltrow's attorney. Gwyneth has a history of advocating for what she believes in. This situation was no different, and she will continue to stand for what she believes is right. With dueling allegations, the trial boiled down to who the jury believed. The now 76-year-old retired optometrist sued Paltrow for a minimum $300,000, but his attorneys asking the jury for $3 million after he broke four ribs and said he suffered permanent brain damage. Was this worth it? Absolutely not. The jury deciding Sanderson was 100% at fault. I believe she thinks she has the truth. I believe she thinks that. And I said I would not bring any falsehoods. I'm going to tell the truth, and I did. Absolutely. During the trial, Paltrow and Sanderson both said they were the ones hit from behind. A parade of witnesses theorized who was at fault. But it all came down to the actress and eye doctor. It was like somebody was out of control and going to hit a tree and was going to die. And that's what I had until I was hit. I said, you skied directly into my effing back. And he said, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. The jury in this civil trial was hardly the only ones fixated on the Utah hearing. The case was live streamed and went viral on social media. Paltrow's attorney said the Oscar winner was targeted because of her fame and wealth. Paltrow mouthing thank you to the jury after her win. In a statement, Paltrow said she was pleased with the outcome. Soon the judge will rule if the defendant also has to pay her legal fees. Back to you. Okay, Miguel Almaguer, thanks so much. Time for some international headlines now. Turkey's parliament voted unanimously to formally approve Finland's NATO membership. Claudio Lavanga joins us now from Rome with that and more. Good morning, Claudio. Good morning. Yes, the decision by Turkey to ratify uh, Finland's application to join NATO comes literally days after the Hungarian pro parliament also endorsed uh, Helsinki's application to uh, join the alliance. Now, with the appro approval by Turkey and Hungary, Finland is now on its way to join the alliance, while the application from Sweden, the other Scandinavian country that applied to join NATO after Russia invaded Ukraine, is still hanging. Turkey accuses Sweden of harboring groups it deems to be terrorist organizations, including militant Kurdish groups and people associated with a 2016 coup attempt. Now let's go to Russia, where an American journalist working for the Wall Street Journal has been charged with spying. 
The Wall Street Journal denied espionage allegations against its reporter, Evan Gertrich, and demanded his immediate release. The White House called the esp espionage charges ridiculous and urged U.S. citizens leaving or traveling in Russia to leave immediately. Now moving on to Germany, where King Charles III stuck his hands into a liquid mass of raw cheese. The king is in Germany for his first state visit abroad and decided to get a hands-on experience in cheese making. During his visit in an eco village, he was also treated to a cake in the shape of a crown. Now there will be his crowning in only a few weeks, so hopefully he puts the right one on his head. <laughs> yes, not the cake. That story was full of twists and turns, Claudio. Very well be a done. Mess. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, coming up this morning, more on that landmark indictment of former President Donald Trump. Those criminal charges in New York may not be the biggest threat for the former president. We'll have more on the other legal investigations he's under. All that's next. Welcome back. Even with that historic news of Donald Trump's indictment by a New York grand jury, that's just one of a number of legal problems the former president is facing. And as NBC News chief White House correspondent Kristen Welker reports, the other investigations could pose an even greater legal threat. Hey there, former President Trump has remained defiant in the face of multiple investigations. He's characteristically blasted them as a part of an ongoing witch hunt against him. But the greatest legal threat to Mr. Trump could be that this indictment may not be the only one. The bombshell indictment against former President Trump is just one of several investigations still swirling around him. Mr. Trump has dismissed all of the probes as politically motivated witch hunts aimed at preventing him from retaking the White House. The new weapon being used by out-of-control, unhinged Democrats to cheat on election is criminally investigating a candidate, bad publicity and all. Legal analysts say the largest threat to Mr. Trump just might be the investigations being led by special counsel Jack Smith. He's looking into the former president's handling of classified documents after the FBI last summer seized thousands of documents from Mr. Trump's Mar-a-Lago home, including more than 100 marked classified after he refused multiple requests for authorities to turn them over. This week, the former president was asked by Fox News whether he took boxes with him from the White White House. This is the Presidential Records Act. I have the right to take stuff. The special counsel is also investigating Mr. Trump's actions surrounding January 6th. The former president has dismissed the entire investigation as a horrendous abuse of power. The special counsel investigations into Mar-a-Lago and January 6th pose a greater threat to Donald Trump because they're broader in scope, and generally speaking, federal crimes carry much stiffer penalties. An investigation is also intensifying in Georgia, where a Fulton County grand jury has recommended indictments for multiple unnamed people into potential interference in Georgia's 2020 election, where Mr. Trump narrowly lost. One key element, this phone call between Mr. Trump and Georgia's Secretary of State. I just want to find uh, 11,000 780 votes, which is one more than we have. All of it in unprecedented legal web for a former president of the United States. Now, a federal judge has called on former Vice President Mike Pence to testify before a grand jury in the January 6th probe. Overnight during a town hall on CNN, he continued to maintain that he is, quote, nothing to hide. Back to you. All right, Kristen Welker, thanks so much. Civil rights attorney and former prosecutor Kristen Gibbons Fedden joins us now for a closer look on all of this. Good morning. Thanks for being here, Kristen. So Trump is expected to surrender and be arraigned coming up on Tuesday. That indictment is still under seal, however. What should we look for? When can we expect to see that document? So what we should look for most likely is the charges. You know, what are the actual criminal violations that D.A. Bragg believes that he has evidence to actually support, and really also the grand jury believed that he had evidence to support in order to convict Donald Trump. We should probably expect that on Tuesday when he's arraigned, um, but it could come out prior to then. You know, at this point, we've really been discussing shadows on the wall because we've been inferring based on the people that are being called, who um, the DA is calling in to present before the grand jury. 
what the conduct would be and what the criminal charges could be. But at this point, once that indictment is unsealed, we will have answers to all of those questions. So what happens next? We know this indictment or even a possible conviction would not bar Trump from running for president in 2024. But is there a possibility that this trial could happen in the middle of his campaign? Absolutely. You know, this is a state court. This is New York. Uh, D.A. Braggs and the state judge that's going to be assigned to this case are under no obligation to take into account Donald Trump's campaign for presidency. So if he wants to be somewhere where his court date is, he's going to have to unfortunately choose the court date or he could have a warrant out for his arrest. You know, and I think with regard to whether or not the trial will actually take place during Trump's campaign, you know, the trial is going to move at the pace that the pre-trial motions get decided. Any case where you have a high-profile defendant like Donald Trump with a large, large legal team that we have seen capable of producing intricate challenges that's going to, that, that this case may face, it becomes, the, the timeline becomes a lot more uncertain. You know, and in this case, we know that Donald Trump has a long history of legal wrangling, delaying, fi filing long motions, and just delaying. Um, and that's been his legal strategy throughout. So I imagine that will be his legal strategy here. As we just heard from our Kristen Welker, this is just one of the many investigations that Trump is facing. And legal analysts saying that the legal threat to Trump, the greater one, could actually be the investigations led by special counsel Jack Smith. So we know that uh, Mike Pence has also been subpoenaed for that. What do we expect from that investigation? Is there any timeline at all? You know, again, it's going to be very similar to this. We don't know. It's really going to be determinative upon how much evidence the DA believes that they need to present and what they think the grand jury needs to hear. And in this case, this was a legal victory for the DA. Um, Pence is going to be testifying, and his testimony is going to be crucial to the investigation, given his central role in the events leading up to the Capitol attack and his refusal, really, to comply with Trump's uh, demands. So this is going to be very interesting, but very much like the investigation we saw with DA Bragg's. The timeline is really, uh, excuse me, the DOJ with Jack Smith, but very much uh, like the investigation that we see with DA Braggs, the timeline is going to be dictated by the confidence that that prosecutor has to bring these charges. And that's not even to mention what's going on in Georgia for the former president as well. All right, Kristen Gibbons Fedden, thanks so much. So what are voters saying? Let's bring in NBC News Washington correspondent Yamiche Alcindor for more on that. Yamiche, good morning. Recent polling shows a major divide in how Americans are viewing this case. Walk us through those numbers and what do they tell us? Well, the numbers really tell us that the way that you see and perceive the Manhattan DA's case is really uh, motivated in some ways by what you see, the way that you see your political party. So putting it up, it should be 23 percent of people say they should be disqualifying, but 75 percent of, of, of Republicans and of Americans are saying um, that they should not be disqualified. You should also look at a Quinnipiac poll that really shows from a two to one margin, Americans are saying that this is something that is being motivated by politics, not law. So if you look at those numbers, 93% of Republicans see it that way. 70% of independents see this as being motivated by politics, while 66% of Democrats see this as being motivated by law. Add to that that a whopping 72% of Republicans see this, see President Trump, former President Trump, as having a mainly positive impact on the Republican Party. Think about that. That's after all these legal problems that he's having. That's after the fact that he lost the 2020 election. That's after the January 6th Capitol attack. So it really shows you that Americans are looking at the from a political point of view as well as a legal one. And some in his base just going to stick with him no matter what. And Yamiche, I understand you also spoke with Democratic voters about the grand jury investigation. I know a lot of Democratic voters have been celebrating, but are there some concerns from them as well? I have been speaking to voters, and some Democratic voters tell me that they're worried that this first case, which is, of course, about the hush money payment to Stormy Daniels, that it could be weak, that it could muddy the waters, that it could make it even harder for the other prosecutions or possible indictments that come when we think about the Georgia case, possibly, when it comes to interference in the election or the special counsel's case when it comes to January 6th, that those cases could be muddied because of this. We've also, at NBC News, been talking to voters in New York. Take a listen to what they had to say. Alvin Bragg is my uh, DA, and I'm very upset with him. I think he needs to resign. We're so grateful to the courage of the DA here in Manhattan and to the, je the whole grand jury who exercised clear wisdom. 
So there you have it, really two stark messages coming from, of course, Trump supporters who are saying this is terrible, this is a political prosecution, and then people who are against former President Trump and who are they're saying for the rule of law, saying that this is the right step. We know many people dismissed Trump's run for president back in 2016. Could all of this attention to his indictment actually boost his popularity among supporters and give him any momentum going into 2024? Well, it's really interesting because in the short term, this could actually help former President Trump politically within the Republican Party. Um, you're seeing a number of his potential rivals for the GOP nomination. I'm thinking about Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, former Vice President Mike Pence. They're standing up and sticking with former President Trump, saying that this could be a political prosecution. Meanwhile, you have possibly an opening here where he could have a glide path to the GOP nomination. Of course, the question is, in the long term, how could this help him politically? Because this could mean that the general election, if he makes it there, this general election could be harder for former President Trump because of these legal problems, given the fact that in 2020, former, former President Trump lost to President Biden. And President Biden, though he hasn't announced yet, looks like he's probably going to run for re-election. All right, we'll have to see how this all plays out. You, Michelle Sindor, thank you so much. All right, coming up this morning, an insight into the health of our economy. With inflation still sky high, we'll get an update on the strength of the American consumer with new data just out on personal spending and income. That's next. We're back with some breaking economic data. Yeah, the February personal income and spending report was released this morning. Personal income rose by 0.3% and disposable personal income increased by just 0.5%. All right, Investopedia's editor-in-chief Caleb Silver joins us now to break this all down for us. So, Caleb, what do you think of these numbers and how do they compare with the previous report? It shows that the consumer is still holding up here despite inflation. We also got the key PCE index. That's the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index. That's the Fed's preferred gauge of inflation. Why? Because it tracks the economy more closely. It tracks our spending more closely. And that rose less than expected as well. So inflation coming down, the core there, 4.6%. Remember, the Fed wants inflation around 2%. We're still close to 5%, but coming down slowly, this is actually a good sign. Markets are loving this. You just mentioned P PCE, the Personal Consumption Expenditure Price Index, as you mentioned, a 0.3% in February. What does that tell us about the state of inflation right now? It says it's slowly coming down, or it's increasing much less than it used to on a month-over-month -month basis, which is making that year-over-year -year, uh, basis look even better. So we're trying to get down to 2%. The Fed's been raising interest rates. They raised them again last week. They'll probably raise them again one more time in May. But that might be it, because we are seeing this trend, this steady trend of prices increasing at a lower rate. Tough to actually imagine that as you're a consumer, but we keep spending. Consumer spending, 70% of GDP, so spending holding up as well over the past two months, and income also holding up. So we're saving a little bit more money, and we're spending a little bit less. It's actually a nice, uh, not-so-hot, not-so-cold reading here. It seems like every few minutes now we're getting an increase in the interest rates from the Fed. Do reports like these, do they, does that affect their decision on whether or not they're going to go through with an increase? Absolutely. This is one of the key reports, and this used to be headline news until some other things superseded <laughs> it, like banks, like some other issues. But the Fed is watching this gauge very closely because it's telling it whether or not the economy is really cooling down or not. It's been slow to cool, but now we're in this nice cooling phase. This is a good sign for the Fed, good sign for consumers as well. All right. Caleb Silver with Investopedia. Thanks so much. More financial headlines now. Netflix is restructuring its movie business. CNBC's Bertha Coombs joins us now with that and other news. Good morning, Bertha. Hey, good morning, guys. That's right. Netflix is cutting ties with two longtime creative executives as part of a restructuring that will result in streamlining the service, making fewer movies. Bloomberg reports the head of Netflix's film studio is looking to scale back on the quantity of films to focus on quality. Netflix has been making about 50 movies per year, far more than any other Hollywood studio. Personally, all I care about is that they bring out the next Bridgerton. Company is trying to cut costs, though, as a decade-long run of growth has plateaued. E3, the video game industry's biggest show, has been canceled this year. The expo was scheduled for mid-June and a return to Los Angeles for the first time since 2019, but it was called off after three big industry heavyweights, Microsoft, Nintendo, and Ubisoft, said they would not be attending. E3 typically attracted more than 65,000 fans and professionals and generated upwards of $90 million for the city each summer. 
Scott Pilgrim is punching his way to Netflix. The company announcing an anime series that will reunite the entire cast of the 2010 movie Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, including Michael Cera, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, Chris Pine, and Brie Larson. No release date yet, but a trailer promises it's coming soon. The original film has become a fan favorite thanks to its over-the-top storyline and snappy humor. And you gotta imagine, if it does well, Netflix will do another one. That yes. might be, though, Bertha, more Bridgerton. I as long as I get my Stranger Things, um, <laughs> right? you guys can have Bridgerton. We have our <laughs> Bertha, thanks so much. And welcome back. The 34th annual GLAAD Media Awards kicked off last night. The ceremony is all about recognizing the work and representation of LGBTQ plus communities in media. Top winners like A League of Their Own took home the category for Outstanding New TV Series. The White Lotus also got some big recognition by winning the category for Outstanding Limited Series. Christina Aguilera received the Advocate for Change Award. Artists like Bad Bunny and Fletcher performed last night. Now, if you missed last night's ceremony, there will be another round of awards for East Coasters in May right here in New York. Lots of big names there. Yeah, award season. Well, that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.